Um, yeah, so this is a symposium about the early phase of bipolar disorder. So, um, as you recognize, there is quite a discussion whether early intervention should be broadened uh, beyond psychosis. And uh, I think the preferred idea at the moment is to have a kind of transdiagnostic use model of early intervention. And this symposium looks on that kind of model or idea from a bipolar or first episode mania perspective. So what can we learn from the data we have in uh, people with first episode uh, mania as regards this kind of strategy uh, and also what might be predictors or what might be at risk symptoms for actually developing first episode mania. So uh, unfortunately two of the speakers couldn't come, so Jan Scott had to leave early and Andrea Fennig couldn't make it. So the good news is that it's a shorter session and you can relax or go to other sessions as well. But the bad news is that you are missing out actually on two talks. So it will be only Ingrid Meller and me talking, but there will be the same symposium on EPA in Florence, hopefully with four speakers. So if you will be interested in the uh, other two speakers, you have the opportunity to see uh, us in Florence early next year. Yeah, so uh, I have the pleasure to introduce Ingrid Melle. She is head of research in the Division of Mental Health and Addiction at the University of Oslo uh, and co-director of the Norman Center also in Oslo. And she will talk uh, on this uh, subject uh, from the first episode mania perspective. So her talk is uh, named Untreated Bipolar Illness and its Association to Outcome in First Episode Mania. Where is she? Ah, there you are. Okay. <laughs> I brought a glass of water. Oh, scary. Uh, yeah, so uh, thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, my talk was, uh, uh, or was supposed to be and still is an introduction to uh, uh, other talks who focuses on mainly on high risk and, and risk prediction. So I will uh, uh, so start out by laying a more broad picture and also saying a bit about the things that I personally found intriguing when I uh, started to look into the early phases of bipolar disorder some like 10 years ago. Uh, uh, so, uh, hope this works. No, it's not light on that. Okay, thank you. We had some problems with it yesterday, and uh, it should work oh, for no, it's, it's our fault, it's not her fault. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, so, so I have nothing to disclose. Uh, here, uh, uh, if you go in and you read uh, uh, papers about uh, bipolar disorder, especially the treatment and early phases of bipolar disorder, uh, uh, you will read, uh, uh, most people say that uh, the, the, uh, the, um, uh, there's a long time from the start of disorder until treatment and that this uh, treatment delay is a probable cause for a more severe uh, course and outcome of bipolar disorder. Uh, 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 w what I will say and show a bit about is that there are actually not any empirical uh, 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 evidence for that suggestion, even if it, se it seems very natural. There's nobody who's actually shown it very thoroughly. And the other one, uh, the, 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 this is a bit small print here, is also to one of the other points I will make, that there's a bit of difficulties around how you diagnose uh, uh, bipolar disorder, especially in the early phases and especially in the young, illustrated by a paper who shows an, an quite an enormous increase in the diagnosis of bipolar disorder in youth in, in the US. So this is an area that's not as clear cut and 
easy to define as it, as it is or as it was when it came to schizophrenia spectrum psychosis, where the ideas around early intervention started out now 20 to 30 years ago. Um, here is, uh, I'll show you the, um, uh, the, the PubMed hits. If you, if you go and you search for early intervention or early treatment or whatever, early in, uh, in psychosis or in schizophrenia and psychosis, uh, yes, you have had a, very, a rather steep incline in the number of uh, uh, studies or publications that are out there. Uh, if you, on the other hand, searches for bipolar disorder, it's actually not many papers at all, and the incline in, uh, in, in uh, this is, is much lower than it's been for psychosis and schizophrenia, which to some extent extent is, is odd because when it comes to the impact on uh, public health, uh, burden of disease, the two disorders are about equal uh, on its impact. And, uh, and uh, so uh, I, I'm not sure why this is so, why there's so, so much less curiosity about the early phases of bipolar disorder. I won't speculate around it, but it's obviously that way. So, to take schizophrenia to start out with, it's a complex disorder with a high irritability. There are subtle signs and symptoms present from early childhood in a subset of patients, and there are subtle symptoms also present in many relatives who never developed the disorder, and in a certain percentage of the general population, which is why there's, a, it's a large, there's difficulties with uh, a high-risk uh, identification and, and, uh, and uh, intervention in the early phases. Uh, uh, more than 20, 25 years ago, it was shown that there were very long delays from start of the first psychotic symptoms to start of adequate treatment. I think the first publication was in 88 or 87 or around that. And the length of this delay, called the uh, duration of untreated psychosis, impacts both on initial treatment response and on short and long-term outcome, most probably. Uh, and this is really the basis for uh, the approaches to early intervention. Uh, and uh, uh, we see, however, there's a significant dysfunction at present already at the start of the first episode, which makes it important also to try to intervene before the po that point of time. This is just an illustration. It's not the newest. Uh, 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 the review of uh, uh, the association between duration of untreated psychosis and outcome, but it has the nicest figure with most colors. So I just, you, and there's no changes in the new ones. As we see, it's a quite an impressive effect, both on uh, symptoms at first presentation and, and symptoms after three and months and a year. And you see the same after five years and after 10 years. So, so it's something there that's quite easy easy to, uh, uh, it's quite tangible, it's, it's quite easy to see. So, uh, so let's go to bipolar disorder. It's a complex disorder with a high heritability that overlaps with schizophrenia to, to a large degree. And I think it's more and more often seen as dimensional disorders that might be aspects of some kind of overlapping vulnerability also uh, when it comes to risk factors. Again, there's subtle signs and symptoms present from early childhood in some patients and in their relatives and in a percentage of the general population, again, making it difficult to know when and how to intervene in, uh, the, in before the onset of the first episode. Uh, there's long delays from the start of the first effective episode to the start of adequate treatment, and it's regularly hypothesized in papers and application for research funding that this delay, we can start out calling it the duration of untreated bipolar illness, is also is related to treatment response and outcome as an analog to what we see in psychosis. So I review applications for a couple of sort of funders, and all bipolar 
applications start out where there's a long delay and it's associated with etc. Et and I, so, and that was what made me think. So is it where where's the reference to that? So. I, I, I sort of believe it from my background in psychosis, but, but I, I was sort of thinking about, is this the case? And if you go and look at the, what's out there, you see that all papers that are come up in the bipolar uh, uh, search in Medline actually is also in a part of the schizophrenia database. And more than 20% are reviews who are reviewing the few studies that are there and reviewing each other. So it's kind of a circular uh, argument. And uh, most of the studies is done is done on patients with psychotic bipolar disorder. Um, and so here we come to uh, some of the problem with, with looking at early bipolar disorders. Uh, uh, if you look at studies of children and adolescents with familial bipolar disorder, that it, they indicate that the illness typically starts with depressive episodes and that depression dominates the clinical picture in adolescence. And half of patients with bipolar 1 disorder, that is with depression and full-blown mania, start out with a depressive episode. And they can also have self-limiting hypomanic and manic episodes uh, uh, without seeking treatment because it's not seen as so pathological that they actually are aware of or think that they have some kind of uh, uh, mental disorder. And this is a bit different than if you look at uh, the schizophrenia spectrum disorders, where uh, once psychotic symptoms have started, it takes a much longer time before they remit. Some remit spontaneously, uh, but it takes a long time and uh, it's more often seen as something that is different uh, uh, and, and uh, something that's wrong, uh, both from the person, him or herself, and those around. So, uh, some studies, I have looked at the question about treatment delay, and some find no relation at all between treatment delays and treatment effects. And there are some studies show that the early use of mood stabilizer might have a better effect than late start of mood stabilizers. But most of these studies are cross-sectional, so they take a patient, sample of patient, and they look retrospectively uh, of what have happened before. And, uh, and uh, there are also, most of them are multi-episode patients, so you really don't know if you have some kind of selection effects of who's left in the specialized health services of people with multi-episode bipolar disorders. You don't know if, if this is something you would observe if you looked at it from start of first treatment and follow people prospectively, which was actually what was done in the first generation of early psychosis studies, who was following people from start of first treatment. So. They, then we're left with a couple of other questions. So one, one of them is how do bipolar disorders start or when do bipolar disorders start? Well, so um, at least 50% have uh, first a depressive episode, which might be very difficult to uh, differentiate from uh, a, a depressive episode as part of a unipolar disorder. Uh, there are a lot of research going into identifying uh, bipolar depression compared to unipolar depression, but at this point of time, uh, it's, 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 you can't really give the diagnosis of bipolar 1 disorder until the person have had his, his or her first episode of mania. Uh, and so the other question is, uh, how do we treat, define treatment delay? Uh, I think the most pragmatic is from the start of the disorder to adequate treatment, but the treatment of what? 
uh, the treatment for depression that didn't work or the first treatment with something that works for, uh, for with a mood stabilizer or other things that have effects on, on, sta on, on the manic part of the illness. And how do you measure duration of illness? Do you take the time from the first episode until you start treatment, which is practical when you look at psychosis, duration of untreated psychosis. People have usually been psychotic all the time. But uh, bipolar disorder is much more an episodic disorder. So you might have an episode of depression at the age of 15, and then you come in with a manic episode at the age of 25. Uh, does this person have 10 years of untreated bipolar disorder? Should we count in the euthymia? Um, or should we look at the number and duration of episodes? So this is a question nobody knows, I think. And, and, and how is the early course of bipolar disorder? And I think the answer to that, we don't exactly know that either, do we? Uh, so if you look at the early treated course, uh, studies are few, samples are small, most studies are cross-sectional, and most are samples of convenience where we have found some people with bipolar disorder somewhere. And there are some key studies uh, that are good, methodologically good, and have good prospective uh, data. Uh, and uh, some of them, which more unknown by name, like the Boston McLean study, the Cincinnati study, or the study that comes out of Melbourne, are based on psychotic bipolar disorder. These are first episode uh, psychosis that are diagnosed with a bipolar disorder when they come to the first episode psychosis services. And uh, uh, others, the Cincinnati studies, are based on hospitalized samples, which probably is a subsample. Uh, uh, so uh, we know something about uh, uh, what happens to people with psychotic bipolar disorder. We don't know as much about what happens to people who have bipolar one disorder where uh, a, a percentage that may vary from 20 to 40 percent or around that don't have any psychotic symptoms. So this is the background from, from I had. I was at a meeting in the US, I think it was like 10 years ago, and I went to a, meet, a, a meeting, I had a symposium about uh, results from uh, early intervention and treatment in psychosis studies and I went around, uh, across the hallway to a meeting around uh, a bipolar disorder and I came out shocked uh, uh, because people were talking about things that they knew that they didn't have any empirical background for. Uh, so I decided to, to try to find out a couple of things about this and uh, went home and tr started a study on first episode mania uh, uh, that comes from the, the thematically organized psychosis study. That's the TOP. It's not uh, some kind of omnipotent uh, name. Uh, so what we have been doing has been recruiting patients uh, in specialized psychiatric treatment services covering 80% of the city of Oslo, uh, both from in and outpatient departments. Uh, and we have decided, mainly based on, on the experience from, uh, the first ep from first episode psychosis studies, is to uh, take in people who come to the first treatment for a manic episode, and including both psychotic and non-psychotic uh, bipolar 1 disorder. Uh, this allows for recruitment of patients with previous depressive episodes and also with previous unrecognized or self-limiting manic episodes because it was our thought that should we say anything about the effect of untreated illness on the course of bipolar disorder, we needed to have those people who had had illness without treatment in here. Uh, for those of you who don't uh, regularly work much with bipolar disorder, I, I, the reason I, I say this is because there's an an, another ongoing first mania study in Vancouver, and they are only including patients that 
come with their first mania. So they shouldn't have any uh, bipolar illness before they come in. So they're taking them with their first mania. So they're looking at a very pure subsample, but they can't say anything about the effects of untreated illness because the people don't have untreated illness. So. Um, uh, the material and methods for what I'm presenting today are 101 patients with bipolar 1 disorders recruited at start of adequate treatment from 2003 and 2013. This is obviously not all people with BD1 in our city. People with bipolar disorder are notoriously so much more difficult to recruit than people with first episode psychosis. Uh, and we also have 101 age and gender matched patients with schizophrenia spectrum psychosis coming to their first treatment and the same number of age and gender matched healthy controls from the same uh, areas of the city as the two patient groups. And uh, we have uh, 62 patients who agreed to follow up after one year in treatment and uh, we decided to stop there based on a uh, uh, a power analysis that showed uh, if we were going to show the effect of, if the effect of untreated illness on change in symptoms and function from, uh, from baseline to one year were the same as seen in first episode psychosis, 60 patients would be enough to show a difference of that magnitude. Uh, 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 bipolar patients are also extremely difficult to get to come back again for follow-ups. And we have been using a comprehensive clinical and cognitive assessment battery at both time points. So, uh, so this is uh, the study sample. Uh, um, uh, mostly female, actually. Uh, as a, a more females with the bipolar disorder, you see, you see uh, the schizophrenia spectrum samples, it's uh, the opposite around, it's like 40% females and 60% males. Uh, we have recruited mainly from the adult services, so the mean age at this point was around 30. Uh, uh, there's, uh, uh, most have finished it, what would correspond to high school, uh, but there's a significant difference uh, between the patients with schizophrenia spectrum disorders and the two other groups, uh, bipolar and healthy controls. Uh, and the same is the case for uh, pre-morbid IQ uh, and for current IQ. Uh, which is better in the healthy controls and in the bipolar disorder patients compared to the first episode psychosis group. I won't go through all of this, uh, but just point, there should be a pointer here. Uh, uh, so they're moderately symptomatic, uh, moderately depressed, uh, uh, moderately dysfunctional, uh, you can see that 75% of those with bipolar disorder have a uh, psychotic bipolar disorder. Uh, and there's a high, relatively high percentage with alcohol and or substance abuse. Uh, what's a bit strange here is that the alcohol abuse is lower, is the same in the bipolar and the uh, uh, first episode psychosis patients. Usually uh, bipolar patients have much higher uh, rates of alcohol misuse compared to psychosis. So, uh, these are the first results out uh, from the two uh, uh, researchers who worked with a PhD on uh, the, uh, collecting the first part of this sample, uh, Tone Helvin and Sofia Aminoff. And uh, this is uh, Tone's uh, paper looking at the neurocognitive functioning in patients recently diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And uh, uh, what we found was uh, significant differences compared to healthy controls across most areas of cognitive functioning. Uh, however, there were no differences between patients with previously untreated manic episodes and those who came with their first mania. 
and there were also better cognitive functioning in the first episode sample than in multi-episode patients from the same services that had been assessed with the same battery. This is a terrible table. Uh, uh, but I'll give you the main part of it. Uh, this is looking at social functioning, and uh, uh, what you see here is that uh, there's a significant difference uh, between uh, the healthy controls and the uh, and the patients with uh, first treatment mania uh, for all items. Uh, uh, however, for some of them, there are no differences between those with previous untreated manic episodes and those who came on their first episode, but also for some of these uh, aspects of social functioning, those who have had previously untreated episodes have poorer social functioning. So there seem to be an effect of previously untreated illness on social functioning. If uh, uh, We have followed this up with the uh, follow-up uh, uh, at the one year follow up of this per of this uh, group uh, this is uh, uh, one of our phd students uh, christina demo she's uh, currently she's submitting her thesis in a couple of weeks so she's busy at home writing uh, and Tori Luland, who's head of our cognitive group and uh, we where we are looked at the development over the first year of treatment of cognition in this group and this is also a terrible uh, slide I've taken from the, pap from the paper. Uh, but what you see here is uh, at, uh, the, uh, at the start of treatment, uh, where the healthy control is, is the zero here. Uh, here you have uh, first episode psychosis patients. And here you have uh, uh, the first treatment mania patients. And one line is those who came at their first episode, and the other line is those who have had previously untreated episodes. Uh, or, and uh, what you see here is there is actually no difference between those two groups. Uh, the same, also looked at if, uh, if there were differences between a psychotic or non-psychotic bipolar disorder, and we didn't find any differences between those groups. It, it, it looked just the same, so I just show one figure. Um, um, so uh, uh, the uh, one-year follow-up data are, are ready and is currently under review in bipolar disorder and um, there were no significant differences in cognitive functioning from baseline uh, uh, to one year, neither for the patient nor for the health control group, and looking at significant change scores for individual patients show that some got better and some got worse, but the most were the same. So there's a stable uh, functioning, it appears, at least on the group level, from a start of treatment to one year follow up when it comes to cognition. Uh, here is the sign presented in a bar where the uh, straight uh, vertical line is 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 a healthy control baseline, and you, and the uh, and what you see is the differences from the healthy control follow-ups, which you actually don't see because it's these. And here are the uh, baseline and follow-up. Oh, sorry, uh, uh, for the uh, uh, for the patient group. So, uh, a bit about duration of illness. Uh, uh, to, to divide duration of illness in very crude, the first manic episode and in one group and the, those who had previous episode of, of affective disorder in another group, which is approximately 50-50 of this sample, is a very crude measure. So, we have gone on and looked into more try to look at it in more details. This is uh, Levi Kvitlan, who's a psychologist, who's worked this PhD on this. And uh, here we wanted to look at the uh, effect of untreated illness on one-year course and outcome in patients with first treatment BD. And, uh, and we did it a bit like an analog to the classical uh, first episode psychosis studies that found an effect of DUP on uh, remission rates. So, uh, so here's the ages at onset for 
uh, some aspects. Uh, you see, the first, uh, the median uh, uh, first episode was uh, uh, at the age of 20. The first of any polarity was at the age of 21. Uh, uh, first, yeah, hypomanic, 21.5. The first manic, 26. The first mixed episode uh, uh, at 27, and start of adequate treatment at 27.5 as the median. Uh, the range of onsets for the first manic episode ranged from, I think, 13 to 53 years. So, uh, so this median actually covers a very wide range, but it gives a, an impression of what you know from beforehand that the uh, depressive and hypomanic episode tends to come first. Um, if we look at illness activity, uh, you see that uh, 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 the median time since the first manic episode was uh, 1.2, since the first affective episode, 2.5, and the number of, of untreated affective episode was three. Uh, don't ask me why it's one for the manic and one for depressive. I think it's when you add in the hypomanic and the, um, and the mixed, it sort of goes up to three. But the number of previous episodes, even if, if it looks like it's a very long time, if you just take from the first episode to start of treatment, the, the, the illness activity in general has been relatively low, even if the, the, there's a very wide range of activity from zero episodes up to, I think, one had like 22 episodes uh, that have been previously untreated. It had been misdiagnosed as uh, um, uh, uh, emotionally unstable personality disorder. So, how does this relate to outcome? Well, I think the uh, short answer of that is that it doesn't. Um, there is uh, no uh, uh, associations uh, using uh, bivariate correlations uh, for uh, duration of illness seen from as the time from the first epi effective episode regardless of polarity to first treatment, no association. The time from the first manic episode to start of treatment, no association. Uh, 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 looked at the number of previous manic episodes, no association. Uh, uh, however, looking at the number of previous depressive episodes, there's a strong association to the chances of being depressive at start of first treatment, which to some extent is rather logical because uh, the chances of being in a depressive episode probably increases with how the number of episodes you have. So it seems to tap a more depressive form of, uh, of bipolar disorder. So, uh, looking at treatment delay, there is no clear association between duration of untreated illness and clinical measure of illness severity, neither at baseline nor at one year follow-up. And there are also very few association between the number of episodes and measures of illness severity. The exception is depression at baseline and number of pre-treatment repressive episodes. So. Uh, when I got a chance to, to expand my time, which I have already, I think, I thought I should put in something around uh, 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 the role of cannabis use. Uh, uh, cannabis use is very prevalent uh, in bipolar disorder. 20% actually have a cannabis use disorder and even more uses cannabis uh, regularly. Uh, and uh, even if uh, cannabis is not the mostly used uh, substance uh, in this disorder. Uh, I, the uh, rates of uh, alcohol uh, uh, depend, misuse and dependence is twice as high as for cannabis. Uh, uh, cannabis use is associated with a lower age at onset, shown repeatedly, and it can thus possibly affect the early course. So this is an expansion of the work of, of early bipolar disorder from our cannabis uh, group, Trine Lagerberg and uh, uh, Andreas Ringen. Um, and uh, I'll show you some of uh, the data here. So um, uh, in, in the current sample, we found lifetime cannabis use in 55% of the first mania patients and recent use in 25%. 
And this replica is finding from multi-episodes uh, patients. And also sh we also found that cannabis user had an early age at onset or first manic and psychotic episodes and also more previous suicide attempts at first treatment. This is quite a regular finding. Uh, uh, so, uh, what has this to do with our focus on treatment delay? So, uh, we've we looked at, uh, previously looked at this in our multi-episode part of our studies, and their long treatment delay was associated with higher on age at onset, lack of psychotic symptoms, uh, say so some some kind of atypical uh, presentations, and uh, the onset of bipolar symptoms before the onset of any substance use disorder, which is one of these, yes, we have no bananas type of statements. So I think we should interpret it the other way around, that the length of untreated bipolar disorder increased the risk of developing substance use. Uh, uh, going back to the first episode sample, there was a statistically significant difference in the duration of untreated mania between the three cannabis use patterns. Those who uh, used cannabis before they got bipolar disorder, they who started to use cannabis after getting uh, bipolar disorder, and those who didn't use cannabis at all. And uh, this was based on a longer duration in patients with secondary cannabis use. And uh, supports the same idea as from the multi-episode patients that long duration of untreated uh, uh, bipolar disorder increases the risk of starting using cannabis. Uh, and that the use of cannabis in early bipolar dis disorder can be a part of self-medication strategies. Uh, uh, to what extent this can influence longer term course and outcome longer than the one year we have been following up is not clear. Uh, but from some of the follow-up studies of cannabis user, we see that continuous use of cannabis over to the first year is associated with higher manic symptoms and poorer functioning. So some of negative effect might be mediated by the higher risk of substance use. So to conclude, uh, first treated Bipolar disorder patients have compromised cognition compared to age and gender match healthy controls, but better than first episode psychosis. Previous manic episodes is associated with social dysfunction, uh, while long duration of untreated mania is associated with risk of cannabis use, but not with cognitive dysfunction or clinical illness severity at this early point of follow-up. Uh, I think this underlines that the early paces of bipolar disorder are much more complex in its presentation than psychotic disorders, and that direct translation of terminology and methods that was used for uh, uh, first episode uh, studies uh, might not capture essential features of early bipolar disorders. And we need research approaches that take this complexity into account. And that, I think, is what the rest of the symposium uh, would be uh, focusing on. And we will have one presentation on that after me. Yes. Thank you. Questions, comments? Could you just speak up? Yeah, so or looking forward? So if patients have had more contact with psychiatric services, more hospitalizations in the past, or even in the, in the one year follow-up? Uh, I, 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 as far as I remember, there were, no, um, there were not many associations to service use. Uh, the contact that led to uh, the start of treatment for their first mania uh, was for most of them their first contact with the treatment services. There were a couple who had uh, many who had been misdiagnosed and had had some contacts uh, because of that, but 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 that were were just a couple. And I also think that I so sort of 
um, my feeling about uh, service use in, in, in the follow-up period is that I don't think it's possible to see that uh, within the first year because uh, people had, some of these were treated as outpatient and most were had a short inpatient period and then they were uh, uh, outpatient again and, and I think you have to have longer period than one year to look at it. What we are starting to look at now are differences in, uh, in uh, between those who had uh, re between relapsing and not relapsing during uh, the first year of treatment. There's a very interesting study out from the Vancouver group with concerning changes in, uh, in, uh, in imaging findings and we are also looking at and have some interesting data that I wouldn't like to present because we haven't digested it yet uh, around uh, the relation between cognition and, and relapse. Uh, so, so, but I think when it comes to service use, I think we'll need to have longer opportunities uh, uh, observation times to, to, to look at that. Yes. So, did I understand you right that the cognitive function is not improving over the one year period? Yeah. Uh, the, uh, I think the, uh, uh, what you see is that if you compare it to agent gender match health and controls, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the pattern of Cognitive dysfunction in first mania patients are in between uh, uh, what you see in first episode psychosis. It sort of lies in the middle. And as you also see with first episode psychosis and with the healthy controls, there are not many changes. There are not many changes. Uh, some get a little better, uh, uh, especially at the verbal. Uh, learning things that might be a practice effect. That's my, the, um, uh, she, she, she was heading the studies, she's sitting there and she's looking at me. So I'm getting a bit nervous about misinterpreting her data. Uh, but but uh, some gets a bit, little bit better, some gets a little bit worse and most are stable. Yeah, so no change, yeah, at, at the group level. Yeah, but, but there are some interesting things around relapse that you will hear about next year. More questions? Oh, in the very back. Sorry, great talk. Um, thank you. Just a quick question about uh, whether the first episode um, individuals were medication naive. So were they previously unmedicated? Yeah. So the definition of, uh, of uh, being a first uh, treatment mania was that they uh, shouldn't have been treated with uh, adequate doses of uh, uh, of uh, medication uh, that had effect on uh, bipolar disorder. That would say mood stabilizers or, or effect on uh, psychotic or manic symptoms uh, in adequate doses for an adequate period of time. Uh, some had been uh, uh, had been receiving some treatment uh, uh, before they came into the specialized treatment services. So totally treatment naive. Uh, 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 not all were completely treatment naive, but they had not received any adequate treatment. Yes. Oh, my God. <laughs> It's a physical activity that's preventive, <laughs> probably. Um, thank you, Ingrid. Um, you, you're saying you're presenting the data that there are no uh, changes in the symptoms uh, between those that have had a long uh, previous illness course and those that are uh, recently ill. But do you think there are still reasons to do to to put effort into earlier discovery and earlier? identification and treatment of bipolar disorder? I can give you the short uh, answer to that. That's yes, I think so. I think that uh, what we've found, uh, uh, and that is, I think that what the measures we have used concerning uh, uh, trying to capture uh, what lies in untreated illness, I think they are too crude to use that language. Uh, and I, I think that 
uh, uh, I think that, uh, uh, and also that what we find around the uh, increased risk of substance use is, is also a reason. Uh, and uh, there's also indications that uh, there's a loss of uh, social functioning. Uh, I think that what this shows that might be discussed is that the effect of the primary symptoms of the illness is not as strong as has been shown for psychosis. Uh, but but I'm not, I don't think we measure the right stuff, sort of you, saying we take the time from first episode to start of advocate treatment, that we will have people who have very long durations, but but very benign forms of, uh, of, of bipolar illness. They have one manic episode at 18, one at 25, and one at 35, and in between they're functioning normally. So if you just say that I've been ill for 20 years, you are sort of messing up the signal in a way. So we, we need to find out more what's going on. So yes, I, I, I still think it's, uh, it's uh, very worthwhile to look into. But this, it isn't as simple as it was in psychosis. Yeah. Hi there, uh, Dave Erickson from Vancouver, uh, Canada. I'm particularly struck by the, the, the description of your sample, in, in particular all three groups had uh, quite high IQs, yeah? And are all people in Oslo that smart? Uh, or is there a selection factor that might have implications for, for the, the broader study? Uh, yeah, okay. I, I think uh, a couple of uh, the, the people sitting right in front of you, is the people working with cognition in my group would say be better to answer that than I am. Uh, but one thing is that uh, that IQ is, is a kind of a normative thing. So with the changes of society, you actually see a an increase in what's measured by IQ uh, uh, measures. Uh, so uh, I don't know the exact uh, things there. Akaya could probably say something about it. Uh, but uh, but uh, but and also we take out everybody uh, with uh, uh, who have uh, neurological disorders who had had injury and 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 we also have a uh, a cutoff of IQ of 70 uh, for being able to give informed consent so i think that takes out the sort of outer left part of of the bell curve for IQ and you get a and you you get your your mean going upwards yeah but we we tend to find it so it might be norwegians are smarter but i don't i don't think so no <laughs> So, yeah, so we better move on. Yes. Even this, uh, so, so uh, I jump yeah. down and into Thank you very much. So, uh, <laughs> then it's my pleasure to introduce my, the, the chair of the symposium, Andreas Bechtolf. Uh, he is uh, chief arts of uh, the Vivantes Klinikum in Kreuzberg uh, uh, and Friedrichshain in Berlin, uh, where he presented some interesting data on uh, culture and migration yesterday, and he's also a professor at the University of Cologne. And uh, his presentation today will be some of the uh, work going out from there, and also from his work at the Origin Center in Melbourne, where he is also affiliated. Yeah, thank you very much for this kind introduction. Yeah, so I will t uh, talk a little bit about uh, bipolar at risk criteria we developed with the colleagues in uh, Melbourne. And maybe I, I should stress that it was a very pragmatic approach, uh, looking at the at risk population from a clinical perspective. So we were aiming at kind of identifying an enriched population which may have a risk of say 20% of developing first episode uh, mania in order to then be able to work on preventive uh, intervention in that population. And it leaves out many of the caveats uh, Ingrid just mentioned. So it was a very uh, pragmatic uh, approach. And if you put it in perspective with the uh, staging model, which uh, has just been uh, cited quite often. So we would actually look at this stage one, or maybe I 
Can you read that? So this would be stage 1A, so mild, non-specific symptoms. This would be the ultra-high-risk stage, and this would be the first episode stage of a severe mental illness. So we were actually looking whether we could identify in those who present with stress, whatever, to a low threshold service, then mainly with depression, anxiety, substance use, whether we could identify in, in such a population those who would, be with, uh, would present with certain features which would make them uh, present them with an elevated risk to develop actually first manic episode. So that was the kind of concept behind that. So it's probably easier to see in that slide. So we were looking at basically stage 1A people for symptoms which could then make them stage 1B and uh, with the long-term aim to prevent stage two. So that was the idea here. And uh, just to put it into a perspective, there are obviously quite a few staging models around and um, which look from a bipolar perspective on uh, the at-risk stage and not from this transdiagnostic perspective. Um, so our model would basically fit with um, that what Michael Burke suggested. So again, here you have this mild non-specific symptoms and some kind of ultra high risk symptoms. And then again, the first episode, mania. So uh, you heard some arguments. Obviously, the rationale for doing all that is much more weaker in bipolar disorder than in, in psychosis. So you heard that before from Ingrid. Um, there are a few arguments, so there is a long duration of whatever we call it from the first uh, symptom to actually a specific treatment, although all the conceptual issues which have been raised by Ingrid are definitely true. We know about the high comorbidity in the early stages, that's interesting, so uh, you will, I will talk about that later on, especially with um, substance use. There is some uh, data around showing that the number of manic episodes are correlated with higher relapse rates and an, unf uh, an unfavorable long-term cause. Sporadic evidence um, in, uh, for lower treatment response uh, in later stages of the illness for Elysium, that's what um, uh, Ingrid already uh, mentioned, but also for CBT. But again, that's true. It's mainly cross-sectional studies, so then retrospectively looked at the ones who were at earlier stages. So that's absolutely true. So the, um, the evidence is much weaker here. And um, as Ingrid also already mentioned, um, it's obviously much uh, more difficult to uh, define the treatment target uh, for or the, the, the target we want to prevent in bipolar disorder. And within the bipolar disorder scene, there's a huge discussion. We, I'm actually also on the task force of the uh, bipolar disorder, um, what is it, the ISBD, uh, on, on prodrome, and there's a huge dis discussion whether it makes sense to focus on first episode mania rather than on first episode depression and so on. Uh, but we decided in our group since uh, as Ingrid already said, we actually at this stage definitely don't have enough data to uh, disentangle depression, a depressive episode as part of a bipolar disorder or any other disorder. We, we decided in our group that we would actually focus on first episode mania, right? And make that as a target because that would also make a, uh, a big difference as regards treatment, right? So, um, so that was the aim here. But we have the problem that we have the fluctuating psychopathology, uh, as Ingrid already said. So it's very likely that people would present with mild depression or first episode depression, and then there will be a latency where there's no symptoms for several years usually, and then the mania prodrome or whatever would come up. Yeah? So, so it's much more complicated with these two poles of the disorder and also with you, you how you say, uh, normal mood in between uh, in this uh, in this area. So anyway, so we came up with very pragmatic um, uh, solutions to that. Maybe it's not really solutions, but ideas about that. So uh, on what literature did we drew just uh, only sporadically? So if you look at uh, 
a normal course of developing our first episode mania that's similar to what Ingrid showed you. There are, were a few retrospective studies I just want to mention to you which were of interest for us when we developed the criteria back in 2007 or 8. So we have to be aware that at least 50 percent uh, or roughly 50 percent present with first episode uh, depression, so not mania. So we have to be aware that when mania comes up, usually other psychopathology has been there before. Um, we were uh, motivated, uh, you, the more detailed you look into the prodrome of first episode mania, you see, and there are even more sophisticated studies around now, you see that there is actually a relevant subproportion of patients who present with a relatively long prodrome to the first uh, uh, manic episode, like in the study of Christoph Corell. There's also interesting uh, data as regards offspring of people with bipolar disorder. I just want to show you the model which has uh, been developed by Duffy. So, you, so this fits actually very nicely with the staging model because people, uh, what she, she found in offspring of people with bipolar disorder who actually de developed first episode mania is actually that they run through non-specific phases then uh, depression-like phases and before they finally develop mania. So uh, that fits very well with the overall uh, staging model of severe mental illness. And she came up with this kind of uh, model uh, where she also found in the offspring that those who actually uh, had a substance use disorder or at least substance misuse in the early stages, so already in the in when they present with minor mood or depressive uh, symptoms, they had a higher risk actually to develop mania. So that's interesting uh, um, because it's prior to onset. Okay, another study which informed us when we uh, were looking actually for a high risk state where we can, uh, for first episode mania, where we could actually then later on a work on preventive uh, interventions uh, was this study by Findling. This was, this was actually a study which um, applied uh, valproate acid to this group. But what was of interest for us at this stage was that this definition, bipolar NOS or cyclothymia uh, and uh, genetic risk, plus a relatively acute psychopathology, so within the last two months, a, a distinct episode of elevated mood led to transitions into um, mania, hypomania uh, syndrome of 30% within a relatively short time period. Yeah? So we were thinking, well, if we come up with a mixture you know, of depressive uh, symptoms, uh, mood change and sub-threshold mania, that might be helpful in defining a prospectively an at-risk uh, mental state. This is obviously like this, not uh, very applicable for the majority of help-seeking clients because obviously most clients don't have uh, a first-rate uh, relative with a bipolar disorder. Okay, there are more sophisticated reviews now around, so I just want to draw you to those two. So uh, Gianni Feda just had one out and also Christoph Corell's group. But if you look at the... Um, program of first episode mania also in this uh, new uh, review now. If you look at the symptoms here, they are mainly sub-threshold mania symptoms. So it's insomnia, it's too much uh, energy, racing thoughts and so on. So this could be easily described as sub-threshold mania sy symptoms, right? Okay, so, so to de define the bipolar risk uh, criteria, we uh, adapted many of the ideas uh, from the ultra high risk criteria for psychosis. So, so we also looked at the peak age of the disorder, which is uh, normally before 25. We included a genetic risk into the criteria and uh, then uh, actually did a literature, the literature review that's also uh, available. It's, it's from 2008 or 9, I think of the prospective studies which were available there and you see that people before first episode uh, mania actually present with anxiety, depression, racing thoughts and so on. So again, um, depression and sub-threshold mania symptoms. 
And also, we also uh, used a small cohort which was organized by Philippe Conus in origin. So they had a very, a, a very thorough uh, interview done in 20 people with the first episode mania. Uh, so we also learned from, from this cohort that they presented with depressive symptoms and sub-threshold mania symptoms mainly before they developed their first episode mania. So we came up with those uh, kinds of uh, criteria, which as you can see, have conceptual quite an overlap with the ultra-risk criteria. So, uh, so we defined a sub-threshold mania group and then a depression plus cyclothymic features group. So this would in a way correspond a bit to that what, what Findling used in this uh, Valparat study and another group with depression and uh, genetic risk. This is a full definition here. You can uh, look that up in the uh, respective uh, paper. Uh, and it corresponds a bit uh, to the more recent um, scale which has been developed by Christoph Coel. So he also has like three kind of uh, groups of symptoms. So again, the main group is the sub-threshold mania group and then a combination of other symptoms. So it's relative, so our criteria were relatively narrow. So you could think of other syndromes as well, say ADHD symptoms, substance use, whatever. Obviously you could be much broader in looking for uh, um, at risk criteria for bipolar disorder, but we try to be relatively specific and, and uh, in order to avoid too many false positives, right? Okay, so we did a file audit, so in the help-seeking population who came into origin, we uh, screened them kind of from the files retrospectively for bar versus non-bar criteria, and then looked whether those um, who have been uh, screened, so the roughly 170 uh, people, whether they have been have converted why they have been treated in the in the service to first episode mania or not, and as you can see, uh, those who have been identified with B from the files, which is obviously methodological, not very sophisticated, um, had a higher risk of actually being treated with a mood stabilizer. That was the outcome here. Um, so this was the file audit and then we came up, with the, that was published, and then we came up with a prospective study. So uh, help-seeking clients who were help-seeking at the intake um, to, at the entry to Origin Youth Health, um, which is a secondary health service, one has to say. So um, they pre had to present relatively symptomatic to actually get accepted uh, into the service. They were screened for bar criteria, and then those who were uh, bar positive, they were matched with, with a group um, which did not meet bar criteria but uh, had the same gender, age, previous hospitalizations, and also they were matched for antidepressant medication, as you know, since there's a discussion going on whether antidepressant medication actually um, uh, helped to develop um, a manic episode. So this was the recruitment, so 500-something uh, people um, were screened out of that 59 uh, actually met the at-risk criteria, out of them 35 agreed to uh, be part of the study. It was just a naturalistic study. So they have been, mostly have been accepted into the service, have been treated somehow, and they were just followed up whether they would convert to first episode mania or not. And then out of those who did not fulfill the bar criteria, again 35 were matched for those criteria I just mentioned, and then also followed up. And that's what we found. So there were five conversions in the, in the bar group, no conversion in the uh, non-bar group. These were the, uh, the characteristics of those who converted. And uh, then we looked in more detail from which subgroups. So, so the follow-up was one year. 
from which subgroup they actually converted to first episode mania, and as you would expect, most of the cases converted from the subthreshold mania group. So uh, um, one would expect that those who present with depression and cyclothymic features or depression and genetic risk have a, um, they need a longer time until they uh, develop first episode mania. So we would, have, we would need longer time follow up um, to find out whether they convert or not. This still needs to be done. So at the moment we only have this one year follow up data. Okay, so for this presentation now, I, so this is what we know about bar so far. Uh, the bar criteria are also applied in a broader uh, help second population, which is really stage 1A, which in, in the cohort Ian Hickey presented, uh, I think it was yesterday. So in a help seeking uh, cohort, which uh, uh, seeks help or seeked help at uh, that there are many headspace centers which are in Australia now. There's also a small cohort which is followed up in Manchester and probably in some others, some other um, centers as well. Um, okay, so for this presentation I wanted to look at what are the association of the transitions to um, bipolar disorder or, or what are the association of the bar group with other clinical concepts or syndromes which have been associated with bipolar disorder. So we looked at symptoms and we looked at cyclothymic uh, temperament. As you know, uh, this has been uh, proposed by uh, Akeskal. Uh, temperament is supposed to constitute a constitutional, genetically determined, um, relatively stable over the lifespan uh, yeah, trait characteristic on a, a personality. Uh, level, and we know that, that people with bipolar disorder uh, tend to have higher scores on those uh, temperament uh, measures, but uh, this is not very specific. We know that people with ADHD, for example, do also score higher on this kind of measure. Uh, we looked at the bipolarity index, which has been developed uh, by sex in order to uh, improve the, the reliability of uh, the diagnosis of bipolar disorder and also as, as uh, substance use because we know that uh, people with substance use plus at risk symptoms have a higher risk of uh, developing first episode mania. We also looked at the overlap with uh, other diagnostic concepts. As you know from clinical practice, it's very difficult to uh, disentangle um, sub-threshold mania symptoms from borderline features, borderline personality disorder features, or ADHD features, so we looked at this as well. And we also looked at the issue whether sub-threshold psychotic symptoms, whether people at risk for uh, who present with bar criteria uh, and UHR criteria, whether they would have a higher risk of transition to psychosis. You, um, there is, um, um, as you know, um, most people with um, first episode mania present with psychotic symptoms, so you could assume that there might be a higher risk for those who have sub-threshold psychotic symptoms. Although in the UHR group, actually, there are two cohorts now where people have uh, looked at uh, UHR cohorts and um, whether people uh, do the conversion into first episode mania in those cohorts or not, and they couldn't find uh, psychopathology uh, on, on the psychopathology level predictors actually for first episode mania versus non-conversion. So uh, this is... Um, so this is actually not supported by the literature at the moment. Oops, it's not, ah. So this is uh, what ca comes out when you look at the, this is actually a work Ashwin Ratesh did. He's in the audience as well who, uh, who follows the work up in, in Melbourne and um, I'm very thankful for that. Um, so the ones who developed uh, bipolar disorder uh, so this is only bipolar disorder, so the one who developed bipolar NRS was cut out of that uh, analysis. And you see the uh, potential predictors here, so uh, diagnosis, family history, state trait measures, risk cl clusters, quality of life. And you find that those who present with alcohol use disorder at intake 
had a higher risk of uh, developing first episode mania. Those who present with any substance use disorder in the, in the family history had a higher risk of developing uh, first episode mania. And uh, there was also an increased risk for those who uh, had higher depressive uh, symptoms and BDRS measures um, uh, aims to measure um, typical uh, uh, bipolar depression features. And as regards the risk cluster, being in the bar group was predictive for transition to psychosis, but not uh, UHR, being in the UHR group did not predict conversion. So uh, then we looked uh, at this, uh, at, since it's only four conversions in that group, uh, we looked at the same issues in the uh, bar versus non-bar group, and you can see that um, in the bar group, people tend to have higher mania scores, scores which you would expect probably. Uh, general, they present with higher psychopathology as measured by the BPRS, and they tend to present with lower functioning scores than the control group, the non-bar group. In terms of uh, access one diagnosis, again, substance use was relevant. So those who present with uh, um, cannabis use or any substance use were more represented in the bar group here. In terms of associations with bar and other clinical concepts, there were no differences uh, in the U uh, as regards fulfilling the UHR criteria between the bar and the non-bar group. Uh, there were no differences in, in the brown ADD scale, although they scored very high, uh, so almost threshold uh, ADHD um, could be diagnosed here. And we had very high borderline perso personality traits, um, but again, in, in both groups, so in not in, uh, not in um, no difference between the two groups. There was a difference, as you could expect, in the bipolarity index, so the bipolarity index was higher in the bar group than in the non-bar group, although many of the features which are asked for in the bipolarity index are actually applied to people with recurrent episodes so, and so on, so not many uh, criteria could actually uh, be uh, readily applied to the at-risk group here. But anyway, there was this difference. We were a bit surprised that there was no um, difference or even uh, one difference in the uh, other direction than we expected with the temp score, so the temperament measure. Um, so there was no difference and especially in the one we were expecting to be uh, uh, relatively high in the bar group, it was even lower than in the non-bar group. But when you look at that a bit more in a bit more detail, so we looked at correlates between the TEMS and the Brown AD and the borderline questionnaire, which is here. So the TEMS cyclothymic uh, score, you can see that those who score high on the TEMS cyclothymic score also score higher on the Brown AD, ADD score and also high on the borderline questionnaire score. So it might be, uh, has, might has to do with that, that um, the population in general scored high on borderline traits and on ADHD traits, uh, that's why this, um, uh, th this um, finding appeared. Okay, so that's um, to sum up, around 10% of the help-seeking adolescents uh, which have been help-seeking in a secondary uh, service fulfilled the bar criteria, so it, it looks like it is a, a relevant uh, subgroup. They are already substantially low functioning um, they have relatively low uh, SOFA scores. I didn't allude to that. There were a relevant number who uh, had suicide attempts before uh, being assessed for the bar criteria. Most people with uh, the bar criteria fulfill anxiety, depression, or substance use diagnosis. So it's really a, a, a stage 1A population. Um, as compared to the non-bar, uh, uh, they present with more mania symptoms, more symptoms in general, and lower function and more substance use disorder. The conver conversion rate is 
could be higher, but it, I think could is relevant in terms of uh, thinking of uh, prevention effort in that group. Um, and it might make st sense to uh, come back to this uh, model uh, Philippe Cornus uh, um, came up with to uh, differentiate between a proximal and distal stage uh, because we found uh, that um, the subthreshold mania group actually had a much higher uh, conversion rate than the two other at risk groups. So the subthreshold mania group might be in a proximal prodrome, whereas the other two groups might be in a more distal prodrome to first episode ma uh, mania. So obviously we need longer follow up, especially for the two depression at risk groups, and this finding obviously needs replication in a bigger sample. As regards this prediction or overlap issue, we found that transitions within the total group, so, so the uh, stage 1A group uh, was predicted by substance use, family history of substance use, bar criteria, and low physical quality of life. And the, the group um, which fulfilled bar criteria showed uh, higher uh, scores as regards the bipolarity index higher young mania score, high, higher cannabis and substance use disorder, and lower, unexpectedly lower uh, scores in TEMS than the non-bar group. And the bar criteria were not associated with, um, as compared to the non-bar group, with borderline personality traits or measures of attention deficits disorder. Obviously, this was a methodological limited uh, study, also the association studies, because these were self-ratings and no proper SCID 2 diagnosis, which uh, have been done in this population. We only did SCID 1 diagnosis in that um, population. And there was also no correlation between transition to psychosis, uh, between transition to mania and fulfilling ultra high risk criteria for psychosis. Okay, thank you. Questions? Any questions? Yes. Thank you, very interesting talk. I wonder what, do you, what would be the clinical implications of, the, of this, the bar, fulfilling the bar criteria? What do you provide of uh, services and, and treatment for? Um, we, we don't have an intervention study yet, so it's, it's more still a bit more about validating the criteria and see what the transition rates are. And then it would be interesting whether those who transitioned, whether they have lower functioning or whatever, uh, less role functioning than those who do not. I, that's still uh, still an issue. We were thinking, and I think the, the uh, colleagues in Manchester, they are working on a CBT intervention. So, so we were thinking of something like that, yeah, like a benign, well acceptable intervention in order to prevent the onset of first episode mania. But there are no trials yet, as far as I know. Just, uh, just a comment, because uh, usually presenting with only a, a depression or two would, would uh, result in a quite limited follow-up period and treatment in, in normal services in Norway. So I think this is a big uh, wake-up call to, um, yeah, that it's actually possible to, to identify and maybe something can be done in an early stage to to prevent. Yeah, that, that, was, yeah, that was the idea to, de to identify an at-risk population where probably a preventive intervention would make sense. I mean, obviously the data is relatively weak. I mean, this is on only 35 people, right? So we definitely need a replication. Uh, there is, so if Jan Scott would have showed up, she would have uh, showed that another sample where we tried, or where she actually tried to apply the bar criteria at, where, where she again found that uh, bar criteria could predict onset of mania. Um, so it's probably that stage that we have to come up with more samples and more, more validity there. Um, thank you. It was really interesting. Did you um, 
I think I might have missed it, um, but did you have a, a su suicide or behavior or, or completed suicides in your group? Not specifically. We have it in the... I think I went over it when I presented the base. Oh, it's not going back. Can I go back? We not. only asked... Um, we did several depression measures and there would be suicidality in it. I did not... I don't have the the um, data for suicidality um, with me especially. But it was a, oh no, this, just this is gone, that's weird. No, but that's the total sample would be in, um, because in that one there was actually, I think it was 30% uh, uh, of the population who had already, uh, no, it's gone. That's really interesting. <laughs> anyway, uh, they they had a high suicide risk, definitely. Yeah, yeah. There were no suicides in the trial in these 12 months, but we don't have follow-up data. And beforehand, I th it was really a high number who had uh, suicides. Because they certainly sound like a group that would be very much at risk um, yeah. from that point. Yeah, and they had this really, really high... Uh, borderline traits on top of that, yeah. So it was really a risky, low-functioning group, definitely, who would probably fit well in David Fowler's uh, study from this morning. <laughs> so. A very interesting talk. Um, can I ask you, with, with the bar criteria, um, how young would you apply the, the criteria um, w would it be applicable, is it, do you think, in an adolescent population, or yeah, would it have I to be adapted? We did that. I mean, yeah. it was the origin intake criteria, yeah. so 15 to 25. Yeah. And do you think it needs to be modified a bit, say, for the younger age group? Below Given 15, or the, what do you mean by in younger? Sort of, well, tw 12 to 18. Mm, yeah, we don't have uh, yeah. experience below 15. Yeah. I mean, there's always this, this issue which is really difficult to differentiate what are ADD criteria. I mean, obviously, you have the time course, which is relevant there, but the overlap with the borderline traits, right? So it's, uh, it's not so easy, actually, to explore them properly, whether they fulfill bar criteria on top of those traits, right? So that might be a bit mm. uh, tricky. I don't have experience in applying it below 15, so origin also done. So Ashwin is sitting there now. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so obviously it's a very pragmatic approach which has several limitations, but yeah, so if people are interested to pick that up and maybe to apply it to their population, it would be probably really helpful. Yeah, so thanks to Ashwin Ratesh for all this uh, support and analysis who did most of the work here. It's in the audience as well. Ah. So what I found rather interesting is that there seems to be no connection to ultra high risk criteria. Mm. How yeah. does that come? Is uh, there different pathways with? Uh, well, I mean, they fulfilled ultra high risk criteria for psychosis as well. Yeah, so 50% fulfilled them, um, but it was not correlated with transition, right? But that's what we found in so in. Um, in, uh, at Origin, uh, we looked at, um, in these big cohorts who present with ultra high risk criteria, you always have some which develop first episode mania at the end, right? And we looked at those who actually did that, but, you, but at intake, you couldn't differentiate them from those who do not convert to mania. So that fits in a way, right? So the ultra high risk criteria do not say much about developing first episode mania later on. That was in the PACE sample in Melbourne, and that was also the case in the Sugar Hill uh, sample with Barbara Kornblatt's and Christoph Corell's group. And it's probably also the case in the PACE 400, so in the bigger PACE uh, study, which is uh, which Ashwin is just analyzing. So it's interesting, but it's 
consistent in a way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So thanks for coming, and enjoy the rest of the conference.